Okay, hi everybody, and welcome to this new session of the ETOX. Uh, today we'll have the pleasure to listen to Ben Kuypers, who is a professor from the University of Michigan, professor in computer science and uh, engineering. A little bit of bio, uh, Professor Kuypers received his PhD in uh, mathematics from MIT, where he worked uh, for quite a long time with uh, Marvin Minsky, one of the fathers of uh, artificial intelligence. I continued working at MIT for a while and then moved to uh, the uh, University of Texas at Austin, where he held an uh, endorsed professorship in computer science. Um, he investigates the uh, representation of common sense and expert knowledge and uh, addres addresses problems such as the uh, acquisition of special knowledge or the building of semantic hierarchies or the autonomous learning of representation, the grounding of perception, and many others. I, invi I invite you to visit his website for an exhaustive list uh, of this, a website where he also shares opinions about ethics, um, uh, military robotics, and so on. Uh, but today we'll talk about uh, how we can trust robots. Uh, the talk should be around 40 minutes long, and it will be followed by a, a session of questions. So let's start, and please welcome Ben Kuypers. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate the honor of the, being invited to give an A talk. Um, I've admired Aldebaran Robotics for many years, and um, I've been very excited to see the, the progress that's taking place um, from, from now to Pepper to Romeo and beyond sooner or later, I can imagine. One of the things that... Um, well, that I've been, <coughs> I'll tell you more about this in a bit, but I've been concerned about um, is as robots become more intelligent and more effective, um, what will it take to trust them? And so <coughs> um, here we've, we see the kind of robot family that you folks are putting together, and as they take a, more and more of a part in people's everyday lives, um, what will they be able to do? Um, that they can do some things quite nicely, there's other things that are um, still works in progress, and there are opportunities for this to go very well and opportunities for it to go not so well. And so, w will they be trustworthy members of our society? So, we see the kinds of research goals that are going on right now with Romeo, Pepper, and now. And <clears throat> it's not until many of those goals have been achieved that they'll have the capabilities where trust starts to become uh, particularly important. And so um, some of the things that I'll be talking about, um, as you'll see, uh, really take place after that but some might happen sooner. So what's the specific problem I want to work on here? Um, we're, we're already seeing robots as more and more uh, functioning as members of our society in a variety of ways. Um, so we're already seeing autonomous cars uh, driving around roads and people are talking about the things they may or may not do. Um, one of the things that I'm doing in my own lab is building intelligent wheelchairs, uh, or building an intelligent wheelchair that can learn the spatial structure of an environment and respond to commands to take people around. Um, we're already seeing Romeo's intended role is to be a companion or helper for elderly. People are talking about robots that will help take care of children. Um, <coughs> Robots or more generally distributed intelligent systems may be managers for very complex systems. And so the real question we need to ask ourselves is how do we make sure that robots can behave well? Uh, and what will it take for us to trust them? Because that will be very important. So one of the concerns is that if we give robots great power, even if they do exactly what we tell them, we can be in a lot of trouble. So <coughs> this was published in the 40s, I believe. Um, so here is the Sorcerer's Apprentice, 
who has a chore to do and implements what is effectively a magical robot to do his chore, and it works like a charm um, until it doesn't. But it's still doing exactly what it was told, and things get rapidly under, out of control because he can't find the off switch. Um, and it's not until the sorcerer himself comes back that he can turn this thing off and solve the problem. Now, this is a movie that you've probably all seen. I need to know how Skynet gets built. Who's responsible? The man most directly responsible is Miles Bennett Dyson. Who is that? He's the director of special projects at Cyberdyne Systems Corporation. Why him? In a few months, he creates a revolutionary type of microprocessor. Go on. Then what? In three years, Cyberdyne will become the largest supplier of military computer systems. All stealth bombers are upgraded with Cyberdyne computers becoming fully unmanned. Afterwards, they fly with a perfect operational record. The Skynet funding bill is passed. The system goes online on August 4, 1997. Human decisions are removed from strategic defense. Skynet begins to learn at a geometric rate. It becomes self-aware at 2.14 a.m. Eastern Time, August 29th. In a panic, they try to pull the plug. Skynet fights back. Yes. It launches its missiles against the targets in Russia. Why attack Russia? Aren't they friends now? Because Skynet knows that the Russian counterattack will eliminate its enemies over here. Jesus. You folks are not in the business of running this kind of robotic system. <laughs> On the other hand, there's a bunch of things, lessons to be learned from this particular episode here. First, it was actually a perfectly rational decision to deploy Skynet. It had operated with a perfect operational record after a substantial field test. Um, Skynet was built as a learning system, which is only reasonable given the complexity of the world. Um, now, of course, that did scare its operators who decided that they needed to unplug it. Now, as a critical defense system, Skynet was undoubtedly programmed to defend itself from attack. Um, and so it would fight back. And it found an unexpected solution to its problem. Um, so this was creative, unconstrained problem solving, just what we would like from an intelligent robot. But unfortunately, unconstrained also by common sense or any kind of moral uh, criticism. Now this is fiction, and you've probably all seen this movie. Um, on the other hand, um, problems like this have actually occurred in the world. Um, now, high-speed trading programs have gotten into peculiar positive feedback loops, um, only billions of dollars were lost and not billions of lives. But these particular systems don't actually understand the difference between those two things. So take seriously the fact that well-intentioned people making excellent decisions can lead to catastrophic results. Now, I want to look at some things that are a little bit closer to um, the things that SoftBank might be concerned about. I hate hikes. Goddamn bugs. You see one tree, you see them all. I just hate hikes. While my program's goal is to improve your health, I'm able to adapt my methods. Would you prefer another form of moderate exercise? I would rather die eating cheeseburgers than live off steamed cauliflower. What about me, Frank? What do you mean, what about you? If you die eating cheeseburgers, what do you think happens to me? I'll have failed. They'll send me back to the warehouse and wipe my memory. Well, we're going to walk. We might as well make it worthwhile. Now we're talking about things that are sort of within the capabilities of Romeo, perhaps. Maybe not the cognitive capabilities, but... Now, let's see another one. Have you smelled our lavender heart soaps? Oh. 
We should be going, Frank. Oh, what a cute little helper you have. <laughs> hey. What is in your pocket? I'm sorry, young lady. I, I, I couldn't quite hear you. What is in your pocket? I'm going to make a citizen's arrest. Nothing. Nothing's in my pocket. Look. Frank. It's time we head home. Yeah, yeah. If you'll excuse us, ladies. Thank you. Nice to see you. Have a good one. Hey. Hey. Where did this come from? From the store. Remember? Yeah, yeah, of course I remember. But, I mean, what did you do? Did you... You put this in here? You took this? I saw you had it. But the shopkeeper distracted you and you forgot it. I took it for you. Did I do something wrong, Frank? Well. You know what stealing is? The act of a person who steals. Taking property without permission or right. Yeah, yeah, I guess. You stole this. How do you feel about that? I don't have any thoughts on that. They didn't program you about stealing, uh, shoplifting, robbery? I have working definitions for those terms. I don't understand. Do you want something for dessert? Do you have any programming that uh, makes you obey the law? Do you want me to incorporate state and federal law directly into my programming? No, 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 no. You leave it as it is. You're starting to grow on me. All of those things are in service of my main program. Well, what about when you said that I had to eat healthy because you didn't want your memory erased? You know, I think there's something more going on in that noggin of yours. I only said that to coerce you. You lied? Your health supersedes my other directives. The truth is, I don't care if my memory is erased or not. But how can you not care about something like that? Think about it this way. You know that you're alive. You think, therefore you are. Ah, uh, that's philosophy. In a similar way, I know that I'm not alive. I'm a robot. I don't want to talk about how you don't exist. It's making me uncomfortable. So how many of you have actually seen the movie Robot and Frank? Okay, the rest of you are assigned to watch it. <laughs> it's actually quite important. Um, <clears throat> now, what are some of the lessons we can learn from this? Well, Robot clearly doesn't have any inhibitions, moral or legal, against stealing, shoplifting, robbery, who knows what else? Um, he has no inhibitions against lying, including lying to Frank. Um, and in some way, at least as troubling as the others, Robot has no concern for his own self-preservation. So one of the things that this raises is the fact that Robot is not a being like the rest of us. Robot is actually quite an alien being. However, much, however tempting it is to think of him as being a lot like us because he's shaped more or less like us. And so the expectations you might have, the trust you might have in this robot um, is significantly constrained. So I wanted to tell you just a little bit more about how I come to this. Um, I've worked in AI for a long time, and <clears throat> I've, from early on, I defined the focus of my work as being on common sense knowledge, which I define as foundational knowledge that provides a framework of concepts for um, accumulating a huge knowledge base. So common sense is not the huge knowledge base. It's the set of foundation, knowledge about foundational domains like space continuous change, the structure of the sensory motor system, the ability to learn contingencies, to pick a random example, the ability to learn about objects, actions, and plans. And in the work that I've done about all of these things, one of the insights that's been 
common to many of them and is quite important is that <coughs> having multiple quite different representations for each kind of knowledge turns out to be particularly important in order to be able to make common sense knowledge as robust as it is. <laughs> so one of the issues is that <laughs> poor Pepper always looks so cast down <laughs> when she's powered off. Um, <clears throat> So one of the foci of this talk and the title of this talk is about trust. So what is trust and what's it actually good for? So one of the things that's important is to think about what makes society work. And one of the things that makes society work is cooperation. So cooperation of various kinds pays off in a variety of ways that I'll talk about. And trust is an important a resource to make cooperation possible. So I trust people not to kill me or steal from me. And this reduces a lot of overhead because I, I don't have to spend a lot of time defending myself against things. Um, I trust most drivers to drive well. Um, and this lets me drive safely, efficiently, quickly. Um, an interesting historical side note is that before about the year 1900, nobody had the notion of driving on the right side of the road. <laughs> and tr driving was hazardous and slow and full of traffic jams. And a particular person made this all happen. Um, I trust most people to keep most of their promises, which allows cooperative enterprises of various sorts to take place. I trust companies to behave well, and so forth. There's an awful lot of things. So <laughs> looking for an actual definition, it's quite instructive here. Trust is a psychological state comprising the intention to accept vulnerability, and I want to underline the vulnerability, based upon positive expectations of the intention or behavior of another. And trustworthiness is deserving of trust, being dependable, reliable. Um, trustworthiness has tangible value because it means that if people can trust me and I can trust them, then we can cooperate and cooperation produces improved rewards. So we're looking here at how trust works between people because people are going to need to trust robots in order for them to be functional members of society because they are going to be in society. So, how should we do this? Well, game theory, of course. <laughs> um, one of the things that we need to do is learn how to deal with an infinitely complex world. And, there are, and the way we do that is by building relatively simple models and having ways to manipulate those simple models in order to solve some problem. And decision theory is a particular method for doing that. Um, and game theory is basically decision theory in a context with other decision-making entities. Um, and so if we go and look in the leading textbook in artificial intelligence and we say, well, okay, what, is, what do Russell and Norvig tell us? Well, Russell and Norvig tell us that rationality is choosing actions to maximize expected utility. And so here we're saying that the action is the one that maximizes expected utility. Here's the definition of expected utility. Um, now, utility represents the individual agent's preference over the various states of the world. And the crux is how that is defined. So in principle, utility um, can be a lot of things. It can encompass um, everybody's welfare in the world. It can encompass some people's welfare and not others. It can encompass certain things. Um, so it doesn't need, in principle, to be self-centered. But when we think about larger definitions of utility, um, it turns out to be hard to implement. So most of the examples that we see are um, 
define utility selfishly in terms of the agent's own reward. And furthermore, this is perfectly appropriate in contexts where you study entertainment games. If you're trying to say, how shall I move in chess? We'll say, utility is my reward. Negative utility is your reward. Um, and war games often have a similar kind of thing. I don't care how things are working out for you. I care how things are working out for me. Um, but in society, the games we play, it does matter how everybody is performing, how everybody is, is doing well. And it's been well known for a long time that maximizing self-centered reward often leads to very bad outcomes. So examples of this are the prisoner's dilemma and the tragedy of the commons, um, which most of you are probably familiar with, but I'm going to go through them anyway. In the tragedy of the commons, we imagine that we all live in a little village and we all are raising sheep and I can graze my sheep in my own land in the backyard or in the commons which I share with everybody else. So where should I graze my sheep? It's clearly better for me to graze them in the commons and save my backyard for when times get tough. But of course that's true for everybody in the village, so everybody grazes their sheep in the commons and it gets overgrazed, the commons dies and becomes a bare piece of plot of land and we're all worse off. Um, so <coughs> the interesting thing about the tragedy of the commons is that it's a real world problem. So um, clean air, clean water, um, fishing limits, climate change and so forth, um, are all examples of the tragedy of the commons in the real world. So the point of this is to show that a much simpler game called the prisoner's dilemma, which again you're probably familiar with, um, actually scales up to real live problems in the world. So the prisoner's dilemma, we have two prisoners who are partners in crime and they're separated and they're both offered this deal. If you testify and your partner doesn't, you go free and your partner gets five years in prison. So if you testify and your partner doesn't, you go free, your partner gets five years. If you both testify, you both get three years. If neither one of you testifies, you both get one year, but of course the partner has also been offered this. And <coughs> Utility is defined in the obvious natural way for this particular um, game uh, as years in prison. Um, and of course, whatever, if you just reason by cases and you say, what, whatever choice my partner makes, I'm better off testifying. And that's true of the partner as well. So the Nash equilibrium, which is the, the thing that game theory is going to recommend that you do is for both of you to testify. <laughs> this is pretty much the worst outcome, both for each individual, maybe not absolutely the worst because going to jail for five years while your partner gets out free is arguably worse, but in fact, collectively, both of you spending three years in jail is worse. Now, there's plenty of other instances of this. Um, one of them that I'm gonna spend a little more time on is called the basic trust game, and people have done a lot of experiments with both of these. Suppose Alice has $10, Bob has five. Alice makes the first decision. She, she's in a position to invest her $10 with Bob. Once Bob has $15, he can invest it and make 40. But now he has the decision, is he gonna share that 40 with Alice? Um, and <clears throat> this is the decision tree. Um, the Nash equilibrium is that once Bob's got $40 in, in his pocket, he might as well just keep it. <laughs> but knowing this means Alice is gonna hang on to her $10. So we can phrase that as one of these um, standard matrices, um, but it's got the same problem. So what is the problem that we're dealing with? Well, utility is the obvious measure. Um, 
game theory tells us what to do, but the result seems to be really bad. Do people do the same thing? Actually not. <laughs> when they do this experimentally, turns out most people actually trust the other player. And most of the time, the other player is trustworthy and responds appropriately. So people actually do significantly better than what game theory calls the optimal solution. So does this actually just refute game theory? No. Does it mean that humans are irrational? No. Um, so what we've concluded from this is that there is a common assumption in practice that utility can be defined in terms of individual reward. And that, as I said before, that may be okay for entertainment and war, but it's actually not reasonable for these models of social interaction. And so the definition of utility, if we're going to use this framework, has to be enriched to include other factors beyond these individual rewards. And one way to do this is to formulate this so that trust has value. If you trust me, that has value to me, and I want to gain more of it, and I don't want to lose it. And as most people know, um, trust accumulates slowly. It can be lost very quickly. It's not quite as obvious, but there are studies that demonstrate that um, there are culturally specific priors in this. So people in certain cultures trust each other more by default and others much less. Um, the value of this is that if a pair of agents is presented with a game to play, um, when there's consideration of trust, then there's likely to be cooperation and much bigger rewards for everybody in society for the participants of the game, but society consists of a lot of games. So <coughs> here's Alice and Bob again. So let's suppose Alice has actually decided to trust Bob. So he's now got 40 bucks, which he can either uh, keep or split. Um, and if, as we saw earlier, if Bob's choice, now this is Bob's reward, and here's Alice's reward. Um, Bob does better if he keeps the money than if he shares it. But if we expand the utility measure to include trust, and of course losing trust is bigger than the gain. Um, <coughs> see, Alice behaved trust in a trustworthy way. Let's see what happens here. Oh, by sharing, Bob increases the trust that Alice has in him. Um, this is the only relevant line because Alice has already decided to invest the money. But now the Nash equilibrium is that Alice ought to share and Bob ought to keep it. Likewise, in the um, prisoner's dilemma, if we um, add a little bit <coughs> for uh, acting in a cooperative way and subtract some for cheating on your partner, then um, this turns out to be the, um, uh, the Nash equilibrium in this case. Now the actual numerical values have obviously been cooked in order to make this work out here, but this is one way in order to modify uh, the utility measure in order to make these simple examples work out. Um, now this is not going to solve our whole problem, but it's going to be um, a step in the right direction. So what we want to do is ask, can we redefine utility in order to add value for outcomes other than simple uh, individual selfish reward? Um, there's been a bunch of explorations of this. Some of them involve um, basically enlightened self-interest, taking a longer perspective like uh, infinitely repeated prisoner's dilemma games, uh, and strategies that win for that. Um, calculating the present value of future rewards. There's been some, a bunch of work on credit networks. Um, other features can be added like um, some of the terms that have been used are trust receptiveness, kindness reciprocity, 
egalitarianism and altruism. Um, there's a lot of questions about how applicable these are and what pluses and minuses they are. Um, so there are research questions and a bunch of people who are actively working on trying to sort this thing out. Um, one of the things, let's see, I guess a, um, there, I, I'll have a later slide where I point out a couple of people who are working on um, more realistic models um, that are helpful in this circumstance. Another piece of the puzzle here is that, of course, philosophers have been thinking about these problems for a very long time. Um, Frank is not impressed with philosophy, but actually there's a lot of value to be harvested there. Um, and <clears throat> there are three major theories of ethics um, that are current. There's more if you're a historian of that sort of thing. Uh, virtue ethics um, asks the question, what would a virtuous person do in this situation? And can we draw on that example? If I want to be a virtuous person, then I should probably do something more like what they're doing. Um, deontology, um, deon is Greek for duty. So the question is, what is my duty to do or not to do? The Ten Commandments or Asimov's Three Laws are examples of deontological uh, ethical rule theories. Utilitarianism is pretty much what we've been looking at with game theory. Um, what action maximizes utility, although in the case of philosophers, it generally is defined by utility for everybody equally. Um, this has been generalized to something called consequentialism in case you don't want to abstract it to um, scalar valued utilities. So the, that what's right is defined in terms of whether an action has the best consequences for everybody. Um, now, <clears throat> in the philosophy world, these are often discussed in terms of uh, which one is right, what are the advantages of each one. Um, although, from this point perspective of using multiple representations to get robust common sense knowledge, the approach that I'm going to take is to treat them as aspects of something more complex. Uh, how many of you are familiar with the poem or story of the blind man and the elephant? Okay, the rest of you should know about this. You get blind men exposed to an elephant and so one of them says it's like a tree, another says it's like a wall or like a snake or like a rope or, um, or like a large leaf or something like this. But of course, none of them have the whole picture. So looking at these various ethical theories from, a, from the perspective of artificial intelligence, we can see that they tell us some interesting things. So, the, or they suggest certain ways to implement these in a computational system, um, in a robot. So we look at consequentialism. Um, and here I'm explicitly talking about the consequences of various choices of ethical systems for the future of society. Not just for the future of individuals, but for the future of society as a whole. Um, I've already observed that morality, ethics, and trust promote cooperation. And one of the benefits of cooperation, as we've seen even in these very simple um, economic games, is that it makes society stronger, healthier, and wealthier. Um, and the strongest, from an evolutionary perspective, the strongest societies survive and propagate themselves. Weaker ones don't. Um, so the value, ultimately, from a consequentialist perspective, is defined by the survival and propagation of the society. Well, that's a pretty abstract perspective and um, might be meaningful and plausible, but how do I decide what's right to do now? That it's actually infeasible to use this criterion to figure out whether one thing or another is right. 
So what happens is that individuals need simpler heuristics that they can uh, apply to their current situation. Now, utilitarianism uh, was not defined in terms of game theory. It, pre it preceded game theory. Um, but, <coughs> um, and differently from the things I've been criticizing in game theory, um, it generally optimizes utility over everybody. Now, game theory provides some very useful things that a vanilla utilitarianism didn't necessarily. Um, the formal use of probability with all of its uh, strengths, um, the ability of discounting to represent infinite rewards, um, and therefore the maximization of expected discounted utility as a, as a tool for figuring out what the, uh, what the maximum is. On the other hand, we've already looked at the fact that selfish utility uh, can lead to catastrophe, but maximizing total reward can lead to other pathologies, which I can talk about later if someone wants to ask me a question about it. Um, formulating simple enough games to be useful um, is a, a very difficult thing to do. Um, and most importantly, Interaction between individuals in society consists of a lot of different games, played simultaneously, played um, among various different partners, and so forth. And so here's a couple of people at the University of British Columbia um, um, who looked at people at, at the data that's been collected from people playing a wide ver variety of these economic games. And one of the things that they um, identified is that probably approximately half, more than half, um, of the people play non-strategically, which is to say they don't reason with um, the cases about what the opponent might do. And they don't model the opponent um, using uh, similar kinds of strategies to um, the agent themselves. Um, and surprisingly, even having a reasonably well-chosen set of rules for, for reasoning non-strategically, um, these players get better results than the selfish Nash equilibrium I've been criticizing. Um, now, <coughs> People who, who build on that level and play strategically do do, do a little bit better, um, but it's quite interesting to see how people perform in these cases. Another group of people, and these are at the University of Michigan, look at subjects who are playing multiple games, and they look at the spillover um, of the heuristics that people use uh, in one game if they're also simultaneously playing other games. And so they document that um, they develop heuristics that are usable in easier games and then they apply them in harder games. So people have individual characteristics and they develop culture-like properties about how to play these games. Um, so, and people who face different ensembles of games learn different heuristics. Now these, I think, are scratching the surface of how game theory can more realistically apply to um, having a society work. Um, but I do think this is an important perspective in figuring out how robots will actually in be incorporated in society. Now, deontology is described by um, a, a relatively unfamiliar word, but in fact it corresponds in a most, much more straightforward way to the kinds of things that we are familiar with in AI, which is to say pattern-matched rules and constraints. And the nice thing about pattern-matched rules and constraints is that they can apply very quickly. And so if you have an appropriate set of patterns, then you simply match them against the situation and it says do this, don't do that. Maybe it's helpful, but and, um, it can 
rule out unacceptable options, like um, you don't rat on your partner. <laughs> there you are in prison, and you don't rat on the other guy and get him put in jail and you walk free. That is just not done. Um, and furthermore, that's probably going to be punished. Um, another advantage is that these kind of explicit rules are actually easier to teach and explain than some of the other methods. Um, the difficulty is that if we have a simple set of rules, it's almost certainly not rich enough to handle the complexity of real situations. And so, you particularly if you're programming things up, you know that you need to be able to handle a variety of situations. And so you need to augment the initial rules with exception rules, and those have their own exceptions, and so forth. Um, Asimov's three laws have been popular ways to get robots to behave well, but most of Asimov's literature on robots is actually focusing on the limitations of those laws and ways that they go astray. So they work a large fraction of the time, but in fact situations arise where they don't work. The, the most dramatic case is that um, late <coughs> later in Asimov's writing, he realized that he needed a fourth law, which he, called, which he put in front of the others, so he called the zeroth law, which says that a robot may not harm humanity or through inaction allow humanity to come to harm, um, which would allow a robot to injure a specific human being um, if it needed to follow that. Now imagine what it takes to actually match the pattern for that rule. That would be difficult. One of the other problems with deontology is where do the rules come from? Now in the case of the Ten Commandments, this is very convenient. They come from God. Moses come down from the mountain and he carried them on stone tablets and there they are. And since God is the source of all the right answers, then you've got your answer. Um, not everybody is prepared to take that answer, and not every set of rules did come from God, and the Ten Commandments are not widely obeyed anyway. Um, so where does that leave us when we want to uh, implement rules for robots? And so there are hybrids like rule utilitarianism that say that we can apply a utilitarian perspective in order to pick the rules that work out the best. Um, virtue ethics is um, another approach and it aspires to what they sometimes call practical wisdom. The Greek is phronesis, um, which draws a strong analogy to virtuous action and practical skill in the world. And so the question of how would a virtuous person respond to this situation um, is leads the, the agent to acquire skill. And, and skill is something that's acquired over a significant period of time. Now, happily, this actually relates quite nicely to an AI technology called case-based reasoning where skill accumulates through a number of concrete cases. And so if we have a problem to solve, we retrieve the most similar cases to our current situation, and then look at the solution from those best cases, evaluate them and adapt them as needed, um, and then when, after applying that, store that problem and the outcome, whether it's positive or negative, as a new case that, oh my, <laughs> um, that <coughs> carries on. Um, and so case-based reasoning is better at expressing this complexity. Now, uh, we'll see how well I can do on my time here. So what's interesting here is that the AI perspective uses multiple knowledge representations and takes these different uh, ethical theories as ways to um, express different aspects of ethical knowledge. Um, 
And my claim is that using multiple models together will, in the end, produce more robust behavior. Um, there is an important role for explanation here. I'm going to zip past that for now. Um, here is a decision architecture that was proposed by a man named Jonathan Haidt, where that emphasizes um, a set of rules that yield an intuition, but then a process for generating explanations. Well, so here's the judgment itself. The action communicates something to other people. The explanation and reasoning behind it communicates something to other people, which has an effect on other agents' intuitions, and therefore their actions, which in turn affect the initial person. So we get a cycle here where social ethical evolution can take place. Um, now, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about self-driving cars, but I'll go fairly quickly through this. Um, should a self-driving car make moral decisions? Um, suppose we're driving down a narrow part a narrow street and an unseen pedestrian steps in front of the car. What do we do? Well, should the car take emergency action? Of course it should. Um, what if it in injures the passengers or shakes them up? Probably, yeah, anyway. What if saving the pedestrian causes a serious collision and might actually kill your passengers? Ooh, that's hard. What if the pedestrian's a small child? Worse and worse. Can we avoid this problem and still build self-driving cars? Um, I would claim probably not. That, in fact, realistically, there's no way for a car to drive slowly enough. Um, and human drivers make risk-benefit trade-offs. Um, but this isn't, I think, the right question. The right question is the car needs to earn our trust. The car needs to behave in such a way as to show people that it protects every life, not just the lives of its passengers. And so it always has to act in a way that is not only getting a person from A to B and, say, and protecting its passengers, but is also demonstrating to all of society that it's being a responsible member of society. And so um, one of the problems is avoiding pedestrians that it can't see. It's not, it's not nearly as hard to avoid pedestrians that you can see. Um, but we need to see travel affordances and understand about visibility. So one example, an interesting example, is, is <coughs> avoiding deer. I don't know how many of you have collided with a deer while driving. It's very dangerous. Um, but a self-driving car can actually do a pretty good job of that and therefore show its expertise at avoiding problems like this. The Google car is, a, is another example there that's been around for a long time. Um, it stops on yellow lights. Very few cars do, very few human drivers do that. And so Google cars have been rear-ended quite a number of times. Um, so legally, it's blameless, but it needs to behave in ways that communicate effectively with the other drivers. And likewise, at four-way stops and other situations, drivers signal to each other in order to be trusted. Um, we can have hostile situations. What do we do? Philosophers pose these problems called trolley problems, and I claim that they're mostly distractions. Um, these things don't actually come up. Um, the key thing is that a self-driving car has to demonstrate that it is trustworthy. Uh, and it has to show the practical wisdom of how it does um, its, how it does its, its driving. So <clears throat> last example here is elder care. And this, I think, is closer to home here. Um, and 
a lot of what I can offer here is a start for, for discussion. So this is kind of a prompt for people to ask questions. Um, a lot of people are still thinking hard about what elder care um, robots should actually do. And so Romeo is designed for this purpose. Robot in Robot and Frank is, is explicitly doing this. Um, tasks like information processing, being able to perceive, call for help, tell stories, do entertainment, those are all relatively easy. And so when you look at elder care robots, that's what they do. Um, physical action and manipulation are much harder, and you guys know that thoroughly. Um, so assisting with activities of daily living involve, I mean, eating, bathing, dressing, toileting, transferring, continence, and so forth. Um, these are hard. Now, Romeo is being designed to help with lifting, I understand. Um, that's a tough problem. Housework is another useful one. Um, <clears throat> and doing errands is another useful thing. Um, so what are the ethical dimensions here? Well, clearly, and I'm, I'm sure that you folks have been thinking about this hard, um, an elderly person, as does everyone else, deserves respect, dignity, and autonomy. Um, and so the robot has to follow social norms and has to help people follow social norms. So here's where robot went significantly astray um, in helping Frank. Um, <clears throat> so autonomy, the person's autonomy is within the constraints provided by social norms. Robot, a robot elder care person also has to accumulate trust. And so this issue of how does a robot behave so as to earn trust is a very important thing. Um, an interesting question is the issue of affection. People get very affectionate towards their Roomba vacuum cleaners, believe it or not. And when they send them in for repair, they don't want a replacement. They want their Roomba back because that's the one they love. And there's a good deal of discussion about whether this is appropriate. Is it okay to design a robot to um, cultivate affection and attachment? Is this acceptable? Is it helpful? So what if you're taking care of an elderly person and they want to do something dangerous? Now, a lot of this thinking was motivated by my mother-in-law who is, is about to turn 100 in January and lives at our house and she likes to walk around the house. <laughs> and she's pretty tippy. Um, and, but sh and she likes to have, I mean, people need to be with her all the time. But um, what happens when somebody pursuing their autonomy wants to take a risk? Is that OK? Should, should the robot provide help? Should they? prevent the person from taking the risk? Um, what if the person wants to hurt themselves, kill themselves? That's not out of the question. Um, should the robot help? Presumably not. What if the elderly person wants to hurt other people? What if the elderly person wants to hurt the robot? Now, <clears throat> Clearly, the elderly person in all of those circumstances deserves respect, dignity, and autonomy within limits. And the robot, I think a robot to do that job well, should be able to discuss some of these ethical issues. Now, Pepper is not very bright right now, but Pepper is able to has, has a, a, a quite a clever script. But is that good enough to address, have a discussion with a person? I don't know. Um, it seems reasonable that a person may decide to take reasonable risks and the robot can help moderate. So keep a person company as they're taking this walk and be prepared to dive in in case they're about to fall. Um, pretty clearly the robot can't help a person kill themselves autonomy or no. 
um, and they have to tell other people if there's a problem. So let me bring this to the conclusion and the and research questions that I believe uh, are um, on the table here. As we've said, trust is the response of others to accept vulnerability in the expectation of good behavior, which is going to allow cooperation, and cooperation makes society stronger and healthier. Um, and a robot, we need methods for robots to earn more trust. Um, what do our robots need to do? Well, they need to use these ethical theories. They have to match the current situation against a base of rules and constraints. Um, basically, in order to say, is the situation good or bad? Is the proposed action good or bad? Um, match the situation against a base of case knowledge of situations where people have responded to similar, to similar problems. Um, a utilitarian analysis is valuable, but typically there's not time to do it at the moment. But it can be done post hoc in order to figure out what leads to the right outcome and perhaps compi compile those decisions into new rules. Explanation is very important in order to be able to ha um, um, get involved in the social process. Um, and again, most importantly, to be able to act to signal the robot's trustworthiness and to recognize those signals from others. So one of the questions is, how should situations be represented? So um, what are the representations, and therefore the representations of patterns that um, are the antecedents of rules and constraints? or the models that one builds for a utilitarian calculation. And so my claim is that, that we need to describe situations in terms of actors, relations, actions, and results. So this is getting towards a much more symbolically specified um, model of knowledge that I'm not sure you could count on, for example, a deep learning system to invent those relations but you may need to have a deep learning system to instantiate those patterns. Um, how should situations be classified as good or bad? Um, and so here's a couple of, um, of options, which I'll talk about a little bit in a moment, but basically this is the moral valence we're gonna say with respect to each of these, is it good, bad, or neutral? Um, and then how should the agent respond? Um, here are a couple of social psychologists um, which describe various kinds of social relations. Jonathan Haidt has these six dimensions with a positive end and a negative end to each one. There's lots of interesting things to be said about them. I think they're a pretty good initial candidate list for the kinds of uh, rules that evaluate a situation um, and allow you to compute uh, a moral valence. Um, <clears throat> and then, in order to instantiate this, we need to learn several mappings from sensory input to these descriptions of actors, relations, actions, and results. Then once we have those, we need to learn mappings to moral values, uh, to moral valences. And then once we have moral valences, we need to turn those into appropriate actions. Um, so we want and need robots to be trustworthy. Um, here are some aspects of trustworthiness. Robots need to understand the moral and ethical norms that take place around them and if we do have trustworthy cooperative robots, then they can strengthen our society. And if we end up not having them, um, society is weakened, more likely society will simply eliminate the robots. Lots of interesting 
paper, <coughs> papers and books to read on this topic. Thank you very much. <laughs>